Hello, good evening. This is the news tonight on Rajya Sabha Television. I'm Frank Rausen Pereira. Here are the headlines. Prime Minister Modi calls for partnership between oil producing and consuming nations to reduce energy costs, cautions heads of oil and gas companies on adverse effects of volatile oil prices on global economic growth. Saudi Arabia assures it will fulfill India's oil needs. Vice President M. Venkai Naidu terms intellectual supporting Naxalite violence a menace to society says terrorism has become a threat to humanity, underscores need to speed up global efforts to combat it. Campaigning gathers team for Madhya Pradesh Assembly elections, BJP and Congress presidents hold public rallies. Amit Shah asserts government fulfilled its promise to farmers by increasing MSP of crops. Rahul Gandhi criticizes failure to waive farm loans. Emergency action plan implemented in Delhi to deal with air pollution. Steps include three-day advance alert system on pollution, 41 teams of Central Pollution Board in Delhi NCR to monitor air quality. And in a first-of-its-kind initiative, India and China start a joint diplomat training project for Afghanistan. Five-day program was part of an understanding between Prime Minister Narendra Modi and Chinese President Xi Jinping at their informal summit in Wuhan. Well, Prime Minister Narendra Modi met oil experts and CEOs of oil companies from India and abroad in New Delhi today, expressing concern over the negative impact of rising oil prices on the global economy. The Prime Minister pitched for enhanced partnership between producer and consumer nations. He also said that the relentless rise in global crude prices is hurting developing economies. Prime Minister Narendra Modi held a meeting with CEOs and experts from the oil and gas sector from India and abroad in New Delhi. Stating that crude oil prices at a four-year high were hurting global growth, Modi pointed out that the trend was upsetting budgets of developing countries like India. He appealed to oil-producing countries to pursue exploration in the oil sector in developing countries. Petroleum Minister Dharmendra Pradhan said that the government is now focusing on channeling alternative sources like solar energy. My colleagues from the industry and public sector oil companies and I, they are global experts in the energy sector. Today morning, we had an interactive session with Honorable Prime Minister, during which he carefully listened to the views of the global oil community. We are doing all this to learn and accomplish Honorable Prime Minister's vision of energy sector, of ensuring energy access, energy security, energy affordability, and energy sustainability. Oil Minister of Saudi Arabia Khalil Al Fali said sanctions put by US on Iran is a reason for the uncertainty in the oil market. He asserted that Saudi will fulfill India's oil requirements. Ladies and gentlemen, I had the privilege this afternoon of meeting with His Excellency Narendra Modi, the Prime Minister of India, and His Excellency Minister Pradhan. And I assure them of our full and continued commitment to meeting India's oil demand as well as continuing to invest right here in India. Finance Minister Arun Jaitley and Niti Aayog Vice Chairman Rajiv Kumar also attended the meeting that deliberated the need to revive investment in oil and gas exploration and production. Rising crude prices in global markets triggered an increase in petrol and diesel prices in India. At a recent review meeting, the government reduced excise duty on petrol and diesel to bring relief to consumers. Panchanan Mishra's report for Rajya Sabha Television. Well, the RBI deadline for global financial technology companies to comply with its data localization norms ended on Monday. The RBI step was part of a wider push by India to ask companies to store more data locally in the wake of stringent global rules to protect user data. Here's more. The Reserve Bank of India stuck to its October 15 deadline on data localization, despite requests from various countries, including the US, to soften norms. 
Data localization is an act of storing data on any device that is physically present within the borders of a particular country where the data was generated. All system providers now have to ensure that the entire data relating to payment systems operated by them are stored in a system only in India. Not ever know who, which all hands the transaction has moved into or if there is a round tripping of the transaction you will never be able to come to know so this is some of the most important things it delivers and it completes rbi's monitoring system of not only the world i would say world matchable standards but the world class levels all the domestic companies have welcomed the guidelines global companies fear an increase in their expenses in a way of creation of local servers what is the issue that the foreign companies are facing? One, they say that this will increase their cost. Second, they say is that the data or the information is a free flow thing. You cannot restrict it to any borders, boundaries or countries. They want it as a free flow thing, both the information and data. Whereas it is not something which is globally acceptable any longer in any case. But the Reserve Bank of India had in a circular in April said that all system providers will have to ensure that the entire data relating to payment systems operated by them are stored in a system only in India. The RBI had given six months time to global payment companies to comply. Kriti Mishra, Rajya Sabha TV. Well, joining me for a chat this evening to talk about this is A.K. Bhattacharya, Editorial Director of the Business Standard. Good evening and welcome to the program, Mr. Bhattacharya. Good evening. The deadline is here. What next? Well, uh, I think uh, the next thing that you will see is a further discussion uh, between the financial payment uh, companies, technology companies and the Reserve Bank of India uh, on how to avoid possible disruptions in payment mechanisms. In a sense that uh, uh, theoretically, uh, RBI can any day stop uh, payment transactions uh, uh, operating on uh, any instrument whose data is not physically stored uh, under Indian jurisdiction. Uh, but uh, as we understand, uh, the RBI will not uh, uh, enforce any such measures at this point in time, the simple reason that it will be hugely disruptive. But the message probably will go to those foreign financial payment technology companies so that over a period of time, maybe, hopefully, they will bring their data into uh, under Indian jurisdiction. The big challenge uh, that uh, India faces right now is uh, that how do you enforce Indian financial sector regulations on transactions whose data are actually stored outside the country? Uh, now, there are various options. Uh, some uh, foreign companies have suggested uh, that uh, why can't the foreign payment companies enter into an agreement with the RBI or the regulator here to say that whenever they need to have access to that data, that data will be compulsorily be made available to the regulator. But I think that argument has not cut much ice with the regulator for the simple reason that it, there are larger issues at play here. Uh, for instance, if uh, some sanctions uh, are enforced uh, on uh, uh, transactions in some countries or even on India, then the data that remains outside the country will also be subjected to those restrictions. Right. So therefore, the Reserve Bank of India believes that all the data should be stored in India, not only the access, but also its physical location should be in India. It means more uh, jobs to be created in this country because uh, locating data in India means a uh, few more thousand people who are going to man those data. So there are many other implications. The cost will be going up for these payment companies. And more importantly, in the interim, you see uh, new business opportunities for Indian payment technology companies like Rupee cards or Paytm or Ola cards or even phone pay, which who keep their data in India. So it's an opportunity really as far as Indian companies are concerned is what you're suggesting. 
You also said, of course, that you know the deadline may not kick in immediately or the RBI may not take action immediately. So when do you see the RBI maybe taking some kind of action? Because you called it, if they do take action, it could be uh, disruptive in nature. You are right. Uh, I think just about two days ago, the RBI had a, had a meeting with all stakeholders, including uh, almost 70 to 80 payment technology companies, including the Indian companies, and also some NGOs who took part in it. And the sense one, one got from that meeting was that uh, the RBI uh, is just waiting to collect the feedback from various companies to their directive that today was a deadline, 15th of, of October was a deadline, and the next step will be known what RBI does. Does it extend the deadline? My sense is that it will extend the deadline and probably maybe a month or two months or in consultation with these foreign payment technologies, it will set a more feasible target date. But the broader point is that the RBI's tough line has, has been communicated and I think the message has gone home. Uh, even though the US uh, government uh, had put in its word to the Indian authorities, but the fact that the central bank, the regulator in India, has stuck to its uh, ground, stuck to its line, uh, is something uh, that uh, needs to be recognized. Uh, and uh, remember that Indian banks, when they operate in the US or in other countries, they keep their data on transactions in US or in Europe. So yeah. therefore, so when, India, we, when we adhere to the rules, so why not others do? That is the big question that is, is being debated at these meetings, at these forums. So I think uh, we will find a resolution. There will be in the interim some, uh, some minor disruption, uh, some fear that those who are holding MasterCard and Visa card may find that they are, some of the transactions may not go through. But I don't think anything of that sort will happen right. because RBI being a regulator, uh, which is a very prudent regulator, I'm sure we will take into account all the possible implications before it takes the next big step. So everything has been factored in. All right, uh, Mr. Bhattacharya, thank you for joining me on the program and sharing your thoughts on this thank particular you. subject. Moving on, now wholesale inflation based on the wholesale price index stood at 5.13% in September compared to 4.53% in August. Primary article inflation was up uh, to 2.97% after declining 0.15% in August. Prices of fuel and power grew 16.65% in September as against a rise of 17.73% in August. Meanwhile, retail inflation marginally accelerated to 3.77% in September, driven by higher food and fuel prices. Well, it's time for a short break now, but news and updates will continue on the other side. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Welcome back. You're watching Rajya Sabha Television. Well, BJP President Amit Shah addressed the Kamal Shakti Mahila Sammelan at Satna in Madhya Pradesh. Addressing the event, Shah said that both the Modi government and the Shivraj Singh Chauhan government in the state are taking a lot of initiatives to empower women socially and economically. He said that Prime Minister Narendra Modi has ensured that triple talaq has no place in the country. This despite facing opposition from the Congress. Shah also addressed booth-level party workers in Rewa district. 
He said that the ruling BJP government in the state has brought about development in every field, from roads, electricity, healthcare and employment to empowering farmers. He also expressed confidence of a BJP win in the upcoming state elections. चुनाव आने वाला है 28 नवंबर को यहां मतदान है 28 नवंबर के मतदान में मध्य प्रदेश को विकास की ओर ले जाने वाली भारतीय जनता पार्टी की सरकार फिर से एक बार आपका आशीर्वाद मांगने के लिए आए मध्य प्रदेश को बीमारू राज्य से विकसित राज्य में बदलने वाले शिवराज जी फिर से एक बार आपके आशीर्वाद मांगने के लिए आए और उन्नीस में and also on the campaign trail in Madhya Pradesh is Congress President Rahul Gandhi who targeted Prime Minister Narendra Modi on the issue of farm loan waiver, among other things in Datya. He alleged that despite repeated demands of the opposition, the NDA government is not keen to provide loan waiver to farmers. If voted to power, Rahul Gandhi promised to waive off farm loan within 10 days of being elected. Gandhi is on a two-day visit to the state and visited the Pitambar Peet temple in the area earlier in the day. I said to him, Modi Ji, give me a promise of the people. I mean, I didn't say anything from my mouth. Moving on to other news now, Culture Minister Mahesh Sharma and Urban Affairs Minister Hardeep Singh Puri laid the foundation for a museum of Indian Prime Ministers at the Teen Murti premises on Monday. Mahesh Sharma said that the museum will be completed in a year and will cover work done by Prime Minister Narendra Modi during his tenure. The museum will be constructed at the cost of 271 crore rupees. The proposed museum will depict modern India through the collections related to each Prime Minister and it has been designed in such a way that the chakra with its 24 spokes will take centre stage. This museum will be three houses, basement, ground floor and first floor. This will be a museum of 1,18,000 square foot. 271 करोड़ रुपए की धनराशि इस पर खर्च होगी और लगभग एक वर्ष के अंदर यह बनकर तैयार हो जाएगा CPWD हमारी कार्यदायी संस्था है वह इसका निर्माण करेगी well, moving on now vice president m venkaiah naidu address participants of the 11 month course on national security and strategy at the national defense college in new delhi today in his speech, he shared his thoughts on India's perspectives on building a secure and peaceful world. He said extremism, terrorism, communalism, violence against women and numerous other forms of violent behavior need a concerted approach. He added that education for peace and learning to live together is the need of the hour. Education with values of empathy, compassion, tolerance and goodness embedded in the curriculum can prevent conflict and irrational violence. He said India is a mature parliamentary democracy and the ballot has proved to be far more powerful than the bullet. To ensure security, we need to have a multi-pronged approach. The battle has to be fought on multiple fronts. Extremism, terrorism, communalism, violence against women and numerous other forms of violent behaviour need a concerted approach. The preamble of the Constitution of UNESCO declares that, I quote, since wars begin in the minds of men, it is in the minds of men that the defense of peace must be constructed, unquote. The defense of peace must be constructed in a number of places, starting with schools, colleges, universities, workplaces, and places of worship, homes, and in the fields. Education for peace and learning to live together is the need of the hour. Education with values of empathy, compassion, tolerance and goodness embedded in the curriculum can prevent conflict and irrational violence. Community education, interfaith understanding and evolution of societal norms 
that encourage harmony and zero tolerance towards violence of all kinds can provide the foundation for a secure society. Well, moving on to some news on international affairs now. Amid tension between Pakistan and the United States about the power balance in Afghanistan, India and China have taken a joint initiative to train Afghan diplomats in India and China. The first leg of the training began in New Delhi today. Akhilesh Suman brings us this report. In a first such initiative, India and China have come together to provide assistance to Afghanistan through a joint training program for Afghan diplomats. Ten Afghan diplomats are undergoing a five-day training till October 20th. Diplomats will travel to China next month for the second leg of the training. In a statement, External Affairs Minister Shushma Swaraj said the initiative marks the beginning of a long-term trilateral partnership for the benefit of Afghanistan. This year, we started a scholarship scheme for the next of kin of martyrs of the Afghan National Defense and Security Forces as mark of our respect for the brave sons and daughters of Afghanistan who made the ultimate sacrifice for the defense of their country. I am very happy that today we are chartering a new course with the beginning of a training program for 10 diplomats from Afghanistan in partnership with China. This marks the beginning of what we visualize a long-term trilateral partnership for the benefit of Afghanistan. We believe that Afghanistan is a good venue for creating an attempts of common understanding and shaping environment bilateral and multilateral regional cooperation. And this giant program of India, China for Afghanistan diplomats is a can be a good example to the regional cooperation. Describing India as a regional major power, China's ambassador said China and India can join hands under the mechanisms of SARC and BIMSTEC. He also said the China-India plus cooperation should be extended from Afghanistan to other nations like Nepal, Bhutan, Maldives, Iran and Myanmar. Thirdly, China and India plus cooperation should be extended from Afghanistan to other countries such as Nepal, Bhutan, Maldives, Iran and Myanmar and other regional issues. India is a regional major power. China also have a important interest in the region. Both of us wish this region should be stable, should be prosperous. And we got a lot of cooperation in the, some regional mechanisms such as SARC, as BIMSTEC, as BCIM economic corridor, and other regional areas. So that provide the future direction of China India's. Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi, in his statement read out by the Chinese ambassador, said the launch of the program reflects closer coordination between the two countries on regional affairs and represents a positive development in Sino-India relations. The training program at the Foreign Service Institute of India is part of an understanding reached between Prime Minister Narendra Modi and Chinese President Xi Jinping at Wuhan this year. Afghanistan has huge requirements and India-China coming together for capacity building and development in Afghanistan will have huge impact. It will be interesting to see that how it changes and how it impacts the regional solution of Afghanistan in coming days. Akhilesh Suman for Raj Sabha Television with camera person Saroj in Delhi. Well, in view of the very poor and unhealthy air quality of Delhi and its adjoining national capital region, the central government unveiled an air quality emergency early warning system that can predict expected air quality levels at least two days in advance. These steps are expected to help residents brace for high pollution days and will also enable the graded response action plan to be implemented in advance. Anu Divan brings us this report. During the winter season, Delhi NCR suffers one of the worst bouts of air pollution as the entire region gets engulfed in thick suffocating smog. In a bid to tackle this huge health issue, the centre has launched an air quality early warning system that has been specially developed for Delhi by the Ministry of Earth Sciences. The system is designed to predict extreme air pollution events and give alerts to take necessary steps as per graded response action plan of the government. 
The warning system consists of real-time observations of air quality over the national capital region and details about natural air cells like dust from dust storms. It will also give warning messages, alerts and bulletins. The system will predict air quality levels at at least two days in advance. इस बार हमारे यही तीनों संस्थानों के वैज्ञानिकों ने मिलकर ये प्रयास किया है कि हम जो एयर पोल्यूशन के लेवल्स हैं उसके बारे में अगर वो खराब होने की संभावना है तो कम से कम रफली तीन दिन पहले हम वार्निंग देने की स्थिति में हो उसके लिए हम तीन दिन पहले कैलकुलेशंस करें the air pollution system has been developed jointly by the scientists at Pune's Indian Institute of Tropical Meteorology and Indian Meteorological Department and National Centre for Medium Range Weather Forecasting. Along with the unveiling of the new air quality warning system, a new website has been developed for archiving all the observational and prediction products. The website will be assessed by the officials of the Environmental Pollution Authority and the Central Pollution Control Board for taking required steps. मुझे इस बात का संतोष है कि अभी तक पिछले दो सालों के मुकाबले कंटिन्यूसली हमारे एयर क्वालिटी को जज करने वाले जो गुड और सेटिस्फैक्ट्री डेज होते हैं उनकी संख्या बढ़ रही है और जो बैड और वर्स जैसे डेज होते हैं उनकी संख्या घट रही है Looking at the worrisome rise in pollution levels, the Central Pollution Control Board has also put in force an emergency action plan to combat the situation. Under the emergency plan, called Graded Response Action Plan, stringent actions are implemented based on the air quality of the city, especially in the Delhi NCR region. Vehicular pollution is a major intervention in this time, not only the government but even the public, that your vehicular emissions are उसको ज़रूर हम लोग चेक करा लें जो हम पीयूसी कहते हैं पोल्यूशन अंडर चेक तो एज एन इंडिविजुअल हमारी जिम्मेदारी है कि हमारी जो भी व्हीकल हम इस्तेमाल कर रहे हैं उसके एमिशंस अंडर कंट्रोल हों विद इन दी स्टैंडर्ड लिमिट्स तो उसके लिए हम लोग पेट्रोल पंप्स पर जाकर के पीयूसी सेंटर्स भी चेक करेंगे वी विल ऑल्सो एडवाइज पीपल इन जनरल वॉट द नीड टू डू एंड इफ़ देवन गॉट इट चेक क्योंकि हर तीन महीने में चेक कराना ज़रूरी है तो मेरे ख्याल से रेस्पॉन्सिबल सिटीजन सबकी जिम्मेदारी है कि अपने अपने व्हीकल्स को जरूर चेक करा लें द मेजर्स टू बी यूज विल इंक्लूड स्टॉपिंग गार्बेज बर्निंग इन लैंड फिल्स इन्फोर्सिंग ऑल पोल्यूशन कंट्रोल रेगुलेशन इन ब्रिकलेंस एंड इंडस्ट्रीज स्टॉपिंग यूज ऑफ डीजल जनरेटर सेट्स इन्हांसिंग पार्किंग फीस थ्री टू फोर टाइम्स इंक्रीजिंग फ्रीक्वेंसी ऑफ मैकेनाइज क्लीनिंग ऑफ रोड्स एंड स्प्रिंकलिंग ऑफ वाटर ऑन रोड्स अमंग अदर्स करंटली द नेशनल कैपिटल्स एयर क्वालिटी इज इन द पोअर कैटेगरी but authorities have predicted that it would reach the very poor category in the next couple of days anudevan's report for rajya sabha tv well with that it's a wrap on this edition of the news tonight good night